you. Thank you. Uh, this is um, a, a summary of my intellectual journey. Uh, another time we'll do uh, my uh, work-related uh, background. So this is um, the explanation behind some of my books that uh, you may be familiar with. The book that made your world, which has more than a thousand reviews on the internet, and this book changed everything. In, in this uh, presentation, I'm discussing how I came to believe uh, that the Bible was God's revelation. I was studying for undergraduate uh, degree in Allahabad University from 1967 to 1969. I had already accepted Jesus as my savior as a teenager and I, because of the work that he had done in me I loved him. I was witnessing for him. Uh, but two years in the university studying philosophy, psychology, political science, English literature, uh, it became very difficult to believe <clears throat> that the Bible is God's word. So I couldn't say honestly that I believe the Bible. Now, doubting the Bible was easy. <clears throat> the difficult question was, what then do you believe? And I decided that I will believe whatever the best philosophers and scientists think is the truth. So what do they think is true? Uh, I began to review my course in philosophy, both Western philosophy and Indian philosophy, which included some additional uh, chapter, uh, topics such as psychology. And as I uh, began to review, I realized that throughout these two years that our professors had been teaching us, they knew that the philosophers knew uh, that they don't know the truth and that they cannot know the truth. In fact, by that time, the Western philosophy had come to the same conclusion as the Indian philosophy had come um, more than 2,500 years before, uh, earlier, which was that the human mind cannot know the truth. Human words, human language cannot communicate the truth. Uh, this was surprising that uh, the best philosophers and scientists know that they don't know the truth and that they cannot know the truth. And yet, uh, this is when man was just landing on the moon. Uh, so on the one hand, there was tremendous progress being made uh, uh, in the intellectual and scientific world. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, the what we were uh, uh, discovering we didn't really have the confidence of the uh, to to know that this really is the truth. So, uh, to begin with, uh, of course, the course on Western philosophy began with Rene Descartes, a French philosopher and mathematician, who um, doubted everything, doubted that the God exists, the world exists, that I exist. But then uh, he. As a mathematician, he came a mathematical, logical proof that I think, therefore I am. Uh, I don't need God or his revelation to tell me that um, I exist. I, I can prove mathematically that I exist because I think. I'm doubting. I doubt, therefore I exist. But his proof uh, was uh, not even an, an attempt to prove that he existed because uh, uh, other philosophers such as uh, David Hume, uh, who was a Scottish philosopher, 
he pointed out that Hume was, uh, that Descartes was not even making an effort to prove uh, that he exists. He was only asserting that thinking or doubting exists. I think means that thinking exists, not that the thinker exists. Uh, interpreting it uh, human today's language, um, a, a robot could have all the information which is there on Wikipedia. It can solve complex mathematical problems. Uh, it can ask uh, you can uh, ask him to write an essay for you or exam paper for you or a book for you. It thinks, does it therefore exist as a person, as a self, as a subject, as a soul or a spirit? Thinking exists, yes. Does a thinker exist? <clears throat> this Descartes has not even attempted to prove. So uh, logic cannot lead us to truth. Uh, Hume proposed uh, that uh, our senses give us the information, the data uh, of uh, reality. So we see, we hear, we touch, we feel, we uh, smell, we taste. So these physical senses, uh, they give us the knowledge of the truth. So that's, uh, uh, this was called empiricism, still part of uh, denying God's revelation because we don't know the spirit, the soul, God, because we cannot see spirit, we cannot smell or touch or taste the soul or, or God. So because they are outside the realm of our material, physical senses, we can't believe in them. But uh, we know the truth through our senses. This was <clears throat> an important um, factor behind modern science, which was developing at that point, uh, that we have to carefully observe what is there. Uh, but others, such as Immanuel Kant, pointed out, a German philosopher, uh, that in fact all the information that comes to us through our eyes or ears or sense or touch, you know, smell, etc., it is automatically filtered by the mind. It's interpreted by the mind. We don't see the reality as it actually is, which he called noumena. We see reality in our brain as it appears to us, which is the phenomena. So we don't really experience the reality as it is in itself, which is the truth. We only see the reality as it appears to us. So you see a dream, you have a nightmare, you wake up sc scared and sweating or whatever, shouting. Um, you've seen, but is it reality? We don't know that. We cannot know wh how, what reality is in itself. So the neither logic uh, nor uh, observation, empirical experience, physical, uh, can lead us to a, a knowledge of the truth as it is in itself. Now this um, then raised the question of um, if uh, the human mind, human logic cannot prove God, cannot know that God or soul or spirit exists, then God is dead. The philosophy, philosophers have killed God uh, this was the conclusion of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche in Germany, that God is dead. Uh, what that meant is that truth is dead. We cannot know the truth. And if, if truth is dead, uh, then what runs the world is not knowledge of truth or philosophy, but what runs the world is human will. Will to power is how Nietzsche described it. That this is what matters. Now, um, Karl Marx, uh, who had also understood this, who was also an atheist, uh, he said that the philosophers have been trying to understand the world. Uh, of course, they have failed. They don't know the truth. 
our job is to change the world the injustices of industrial revolution industrial uh, injustices of economic inequality uh, oppression exploitation they are real and we need to understand uh, the economic interest it is the material because the material realm is the real realm in which we live the material interest the economic interest drive everything he called it economic determinism now others who came in, in the 20th century um, such as sigmund freud they built upon that atheism that spirit is not real soul is not real god is not real uh, ethics is not real so this is what marx has said that you know, our philosophy our ideas our ethical beliefs religious beliefs uh, they are all shaped by economic interests so economics determines everything um not ideas uh, uh, shape the economic reality the truth doesn't change anything because we don't even know the truth we cannot know the truth so uh, of course um uh, just before commenting on uh, freud the, the uh, max weber the one of the fathers of german uh, of modern sociology he uh looked at the historical fact that is marx actually uh, right uh and his father was uh lutheran his mother was calvinist so he was moving back and forth between the lutheran and calvinist uh, communities and he noticed uh, by that time of course a lot of information was available uh through the east india company on the economic condition of india and uh, of islam muslim countries so uh, uh max weber noticed that different religious communities have uh, different economies and different rate of success uh economic success uh so he he uh, presented his thesis that the modern economic progress and miracle was actually a fruit of the protestant reformation uh of uh, in, in particularly certain facets of uh, calvinism uh, the, the details of his arguments have been disputed uh, for 100 years uh, but the overall observation uh, that no religious ideas philosophy beliefs they make a difference uh, to economic life so ideas have consequences this has become a uh, favorite um, phrase for so many people So, so Marx is saying that economics determines ideas, and Max Weber says no. The historical fact is that ideas have made a difference to economic life. Now, the, Freud moves away from you know, the uh, both the idea that economic determines everything, or will to power is what matters. You know, he, he saw. that if a human being if soul doesn't exist spirit doesn't exist then the biblical idea that through the spirit we must kill the lusts of the flesh the deeds of the flesh uh instincts that spirit uh, the fruit of the spirit which includes self discipline must govern us and not uh, allow our flesh to rule over us our lusts so if we are very angry um we do not let the anger uh continue um but um learn to forgive overcome learn to love your enemies uh, these are spiritual ideas and um but since spirit doesn't exist cannot exist in a material universe <clears throat> uh, the, what really governs everything is our chemistry our uh, hormones our um, instincts sex in particular this is freud's idea uh, that uh, the driving force is uh, sex so 
uh, Freud becomes the grandfather uh, through Kinsey Report, through uh, Playboy Empire, Hugh Hefner, etc., of the modern sexual revolution. Now, these are anti-philosophies, Marxism, uh, fascism, the uh, uh, Nietzsche's idea that will to power must uh, govern everything. Truth is irrelevant. Now, that's the principle uh, at the root of RSS in India, um, in the, in that uh, the, uh, truth can is really whatever you want to, whatever you can successfully sell to the people. This is post-truth era. That philosophy is not seeking truth, but uh, ideas uh, 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 are basically manipulating the masses to make them believe what we want them to believe and thereby acquire power over them. Now, this uh, was once it became very clear that human beings with their own logic or with their own empirical uh, senses cannot know the truth. Then what is language? Is language connected to truth? This became a very important issue and uh, the most important uh, philosopher who focused on a language was Ludwig Wittgenstein in Cambridge. Uh, um, uh, there, there was the early uh, Wittgenstein and the later Wittgenstein and Bert Russell, an atheist mathematician philosopher in Cambridge, he said that Wittgenstein was probably the most important uh, philosopher of the early 20th century. Uh, he concluded uh, through his uh, long uh, study of what is language, um, what is logic, what is mathematics, where do these uh, come from, why does mathematics work? And he concluded that actually words uh, have no meaning. Words can have no meaning. Words only lead to more words and more words and never to reality. So what is language? From this came the, um, the, the idea, what we call deconstructionism or uh, post-structuralism, that uh, language is in fact an attempt, a, a, it is an accidental byproduct of evolution that we seek to have power over others, manipulate others, control others, dominate others. And that is why human beings evolved language as a tool of uh, dominating others, both our human environment and our natural environment. We want to establish our dominion, our authority. And language is a tool that has evolved as a means of power. Now that is uh, that is what has led to deconstructionism, where the job of a student who is reading a book at school or university, his job is not to learn wisdom from what is there in the book, but to deconstruct that uh, what is this author, uh, how is this author seeking power? Uh, over me. So uh, so you are looking for the hidden uh, desire for power behind great books. So you're reading um, Robinson Crusoe, for example, a man who is shipwrecked, who is an island for 28 years. Uh, the island is his prison. He's imprisoned by water all around him. Uh, he, he finds a Bible in another uh, shipwreck and the Bible is giving him uh, the power to endure suffering and hardship and uh, survive and eventually uh, find liberty. The, but the, the, the today's student is not uh, learning, by reading Robinson Crusoe, he's not learning that how the Bible created the strong character in an Englishman, 
that uh, strength, inner strength, allow a tiny island to rule two thirds of the world. Uh, but no, the, the Bible actually uh, made England a colonial power. It uh, taught people how to exploit others. So you're reading the great literature uh, not to learn uh, uh, how to endure your cross, endure your suffering, and um, um, uh, overcome problems, etc. So that whole deconstructionist movement, which is behind cancel culture in in America, particularly uh, and Europe, that all of our previous history is our constitution, our laws, our great books and great ideas. These are an attempt to have power over others, and we must cancel this. And there's uh, much of the movement of social justice, which is right now being championed in a different sense um, by Rahul Gandhi's Nyaya Yatra. Uh, so he's uh, making justice the buzzword in India uh, as it has been uh, the buzzword in the West uh, for decades now. Uh, and that's the most important to topic, uh, justice. Um, and w our next book, which I hope to uh, begin to give finishing touches to, uh, is on moving backward costs forward, which uh, Rahul Gandhi is trying to make a uh, number one election issues, um, which the election which begins in the next few weeks. Um, so we, uh, he's making that issue, but uh, today we are not talking about it. Perhaps an, another Thursday we will talk about it. Uh, but uh, I will post on my Facebook the latest cover design for that book uh, today. And your feedback you know, on the cover is invited. And then those who can uh, read uh, and uh, help evaluate that manuscript, uh, do connect with Oyla. She is online with us and she will be coordinating final edits of that book. Most of the book is ready. It had been published earlier as Why Are We Backward? But leaving that issue of justice aside, turning to uh, my discovery that uh, Western philosophy after Wittgenstein has begun to deconstruct language because it no longer believes that human mind, human can know the truth or human words can communicate truth. Uh, it, it's in uh, this context. Now, these people like Nietzsche, uh, Hume actually was the first one who studied Buddhism, um, though he, he doesn't talk about Buddhism very much. And um, uh, if, if during Q and A, we can discuss about the Buddhism, Hinduism's impact upon these intellectual developments in the West. But um, uh, Nietzsche, etc., they had really studied Sanskrit, Hinduism, Buddhism. At that time, Hinduism didn't exist as a religion. Um, Raja, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, around 1816, 1817, 18, he's the first one who uses the word Hinduism. So Hinduism as a religion is an artificial construct of European Indologists. Uh, it didn't exist as a religion. So in Nietzsche's mind, Hinduism and Buddhism are not two different um, religious system as we see them. Um, but they studied, uh, let's call it Hinduism, including Buddhism, but they didn't come to India. Uh, Carl Jung, who was mentored by Freud, but rejected Freud's idea that mind is only a product of chemical reactions in our brain. So my mind is different than yours because my mind is a product of chemical reactions, uh, hormones and liquids, fluids. Uh, they are interacting with each other, and so that's producing thought. How does language then work that we share some ideas in common and we can change each other's minds through words? Uh, how does language work? What is beauty? What is mathematics? What is logic? Where does it come from? 
Uh, these issues could not be answered from uh, Freud's perspective uh, that uh, the mind is a product of chemical reactions. So he distinguished the mind between uh, personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. Uh, Freud, Carl Jung added the collective unconscious that there is certain things we share in common with each other. Uh, that our minds are linked together. So uh, Jung did come to India in 1937-38 in the winter, and uh, he. But even before coming here, he had begun to believe that there is a common consciousness, collective unconsciousness, as he called it, and uh, began to wonder: if, Is this what the Greeks call the word, the logos? Is this what the Bible described, that one logos, one logic, one sense, one mind, that created everything and sustains everything? Is this what the Hindus call Brahma? Uh, that there is one consciousness that is permeating everything. So <clears throat> Carl Jung began to, uh, he, he, he was Swiss in Basel. His father was a uh, Swiss pastor. Uh, so Jung began to explore the paranormal, the paranormal, what is dreams? Can dreams, ha dreams uh, have some futuristic um, uh, predictions? What is telepathy? Freud has been using telepathy, trying to penetrate the, the human mind. But also numerology, astrology, spiritism, spirit channeling, um, uh, uh, horoscopes, fortune telling, um, uh, spirit possession, um, UFOs. At that time, UFOs were called uh, flying saucers. So um, lots of people were seeing flying saucers um, um, before World War II. Uh, even during World War I. And so he began to study all of this paranormal phenomenon. And uh, he, so he, Jung opened the door. He became uh, the door where, uh, through which the hippies that began to come to India uh, in 1970s um, and um, even in the 60s, who began to follow Hindu gurus, uh, they began, to, they had given up Western philosophy. They were dropping out of Western university. It's called counterculture. Uh, and they uh, began to explore the world, the realm of the spirit. Um, the, how, that, how to kill the mind. Now, this is uh, uh, just a couple of more steps before I move into my discovery of the Bible. Um, when the Western world had rejected Western elite, intellectual elite, the universities, rejected the Bible, rejected Revelation, um, they thought that we can write books, but our creator cannot possibly write books. Now, university professors who publish books, and, and they have to publish books to be professor, uh, they often rely on research students who are working under them uh, to write their chapters or study and even articulate their chapters. <clears throat> so, uh, our professors can use their assistance to communicate their point of view, uh, but their creator cannot use his assistance. <clears throat> he cannot inspire and guide his assistants to write down his point of view. Uh, so the pro professors obviously speak. They, we heard them every day. But their creator cannot possibly speak was their mindset. Can the creator communicate? Does he communicate? Uh, th this 
was uh, what Jung is beginning to uh, explore. Now, but an important point that when uh, the university movement rejected the Bible to rely upon the human mind, if Bible is not the cultural authority, this is what the big uh, step that had been settled by the Protestant Reformation, that the ultimate authority in culture, uh, the source of truth, what is right, what is wrong, is not the church, because the church itself is very corrupt, can be very corrupt, but the Bible, the word of God, is the ultimate authority. Now, by the end of the 19th century, if God is dead, if the Bible is not God's word, uh, if words cannot communicate the truth, then what is our ultimate authority? This is where um, uh, things began in the University of New York, but really climax in the University of Chicago in the Great Books program. The president, Hutchins, uh, and uh, he invited uh, Mortimer Edler, who was often called the greatest American philosopher of the 20th century. So Ed Edler had, uh, was born in a nominally Jewish family in New York. Uh, by the, At the age of 14, he began to study Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle, etc. And uh, he, he was distributing newspapers when he began to self-educate uh, himself. And... Uh, and be became familiar with the great books of Western civilization. So Hutchins and Edler, they decided that now that we don't believe the Bible, we have to create an alternative standard in the light of which we will judge everything. And this will have to be a humanist standard. The humanism was the big um, force at that time as a movement, the intellectual elite who were not Christians, but humanists. So uh, they, they created the Great Books program. Edler and Hutchins put together in 52 volumes the Great Books of Western Civilization, including some non-Western books as well, uh, Great Books of Civilization, and uh, Encyclopedia published that, that those 52 volumes. Later, a few other volumes were added uh, with great fanfare. And these uh, were uh, a whole great books curriculum was started in uh, the University of Chicago and spread to other universities from there. The idea that students don't need to read the Bible uh, but they need to read the best of the literature that has created modern civilization and uh, so that they have an authority of wisdom uh, with which to live, an authoritative wisdom uh, communicated through the great writers. Now, by the time uh, I was in the university, 68, uh, 67 to 69, the Great Books program was already dead in Chicago in its birthplace. There was a professor, uh, Alan Bloom, um, and Stephen Sampson, who uh, opened our meeting with prayer. He is more of an expert in Bloom. Uh, Bloom's book was called The Closing of the American Mind. The Bloom had taught in Chicago for 40 years and he had seen the great fanfare with which the Great Books program had begun, but also that by the 1980s, when he was retiring, uh, the students were no longer interested in great books. Their parents were not interested in great books, uh, and the university itself was no longer interested in great books. The great best of humanist wisdom contradicted itself, so human authors contradict each other, much more than any so-called. When the Great Books program began in Chicago, the students who were coming into the university, high school graduates, they were all familiar with the Bible because the Bible was being taught in high schools in um, 
uh, America. So even if you were not in from a Christian home or a church background, you knew the Bible. But uh, by the 1980s, uh, the students who were coming, 1970s, 80s, who, the students who were coming into the university, they did not know the Bible, even if they were born in Christian homes and went to church. Uh, one couldn't assume that they really knew the Bible. And without the Bible, you couldn't understood the, understand the great books because uh, it was the Bible uh, that was the, the tree on which these other branches, Shakespeare, Milton, uh, writers, they drew their inspiration, their ideas, their worldview from the Bible to produce what is <clears throat> what we call the best Western civilization. It was a product of the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, you can't understand Shakespeare. Uh, you can't understand Milton, etc. So, uh, a great books program was dead. One year after Alan Bloom's book was published, there were student marches in Stanford University, Berkeley University, and other universities, which was official launch of the countercultural movement. And they were chanting, led by Jesse Jackson, who became a presidential uh, uh, candidate, a nom nominee, uh, aspirant, uh, the, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western civ has got to go. This whole of Western civilization is a farce uh, and we have to destroy it. Now, uh, the, this uh, came to big surface um, a few years ago when uh, the Black Lives Matter and the woke culture got going, the, the, the culture for justice, all of these Great books are really means of manipulation, exploitation, suppression, and this culture has got to go. So, so in that sense, intellectually, rejection of the Bible killed Western civilization. Sun began to set. But on the other hand, Carl Jung opened the possibility that we can explore the realm of the spirit. Uh, collective unconsciousness, Brahma, and uh, that was that uh, that movement was exploited by Indian gurus, who became very powerful. And uh, because so many of these Western university dropouts were coming to India, to uh, they were even in New York, they were dancing. Uh, Hare Ram, Hare Krishna mantras, and they were following transcendental meditation. So the Indian Express in its uh, official building would organize um, courses on transcendental meditation, uh, which even Arun Shori attended you know, because uh, the caste relationships between the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and uh, the owner of the Indian Express chain, etc. Anyway, um, Indra Gandhi, Mrs. Indra Gandhi began to practice yoga until she began to practice yoga. And at first, when it became known that she's practicing yoga, uh, the Indian press was generally against, uh, red, even she was ridiculed for practicing yoga. So when we were growing up, yoga was a dirty word. Tantra was uh, is still a dirty word in most uh, Indian minds, although it is a very popular word in, in the West. So, uh, so the, the, but this is what uh, these hippies and yippies and Beatles, be Beatles were the big icons. Uh, they put a lot of money uh, first behind Mahesh Yogi, Transcendental Meditation, then in Hare Krishna, etc., and they uh, came to Rishikesh and helped build Mahesh um, Yogi's ashram there, which is now in ruins. Uh, but um, this fascination of Western intellectuals in Hinduism and Hindu gurus uh, stimulated my study of uh, the guru movement, out of which came my first book, The World of Gurus. 
Uh, but let me backtrack a bit uh, back to 69 to uh, discuss how did I move from philosophy to revelation. The, once, uh, when I'm reviewing my course on philosophy, uh, I, uh, I'm not doing so in order to pass an examination, but to really understand uh, the uh, why uh, the, that if I don't believe the Bible, what do I believe? And if I'm going to believe what the best philosophers believe, I want to know what exactly do they think is the truth. So um, now I know that the philosophers don't know the truth. And in fact, rejection of the Western the intellectual tradition is what is leading these people into to study Hinduism and follow Hindu gurus. There are many other factors, but I'm sticking to the intellectual uh, line. Uh, it All of this led me to believe that perhaps the Buddha was right. Uh, the Buddha said that we are like five blind men who are trying to make sense of an elephant. So one person is holding, uh, feeling the feet, foot of the elephant, and he says, elephant is like a pillar or like a tree trunk. Another one is feeling the uh, stomach of the elephant and says, no, 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 I'm whole, feeling the elephant. It is like a wall. And the third person is holding the tail. And he says, no, 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 you guys don't know the elephant. I know the elephant. Elephant is like a rope, etc. So we fight with each other. Each of us has truth, but it is truth relative to our experience of the elephant. It's relative truth. Uh, none of us really knows the whole elephant. None of us can know the elephant. There, because we are blind. Therefore, uh, uh, perhaps uh, truth cannot be known. So how do we know the truth? At this point, it occurred to me that what if there is a sixth person who is not blind? And he says to us, uh, I'm holding the leg, and he says that you are experiencing the leg, which is like a pillar or like a tree trunk. If you move up four feet, five feet, you can feel the wall, which is the stomach, and move back, and you can feel the rope, etc. And I begin to do what he's telling me. Then I realize that this man is different than the rest of us. And uh, we, uh, we can, uh, if there is someone out there who knows the truth and who reveals it to us, we can know the truth. So now, my, from my father's side, we come from the same uh, people's group as uh, Sakya Muni, Sakya, Maurya, um, uh, that background. So uh, we, uh, uh, it, it made sense that perhaps he described the human condition the best. Uh, but could there be a sixth person who is not blind, who is sighted? This became an important issue. Blindness exists. Yes, I'm blind. My professors are blind. All the philosophers are blind. But we talk about blindness because sight exists. If sight didn't exist, we wouldn't talk about blindness. So is there someone who is sighted in contrast to which we talk about blind blindness? So obviously, the possibility of sight, uh, the blind cannot rule out, even if they don't understand what is sight. Can the blind know the truth? Suppose the sighted person says to the uh, uh, one of the blind men that the tusk that you are feeling, tusk of the elephant, is ivory. And he tells the other a blind man, that the tusk of the elephant is ivory. They ask, what is ivory? And he says, I don't know. I'm blind. I don't know what is red or yellow or green or black. Um, but, but I know 
that the task is ivory because somebody who knows has told me the things that I don't experience, I cannot experience. Uh, can that truth be revealed to me? Is revelation possible? Now, this is what the modern Western philosophy has rejected. But in theory, if we speak, can our creator speak? Does he know the truth? If we write books, can he write a book? His point of view, can it be written? Uh, this became an issue. So I said that, okay, since my professors have already know that they don't know, why don't I uh, look at the scriptures to see the possibility if this is God's word? So I decided to begin with the Vedas because our professors had uh, praised the Vedas a great deal. But it dawned on me that although those professors who are teaching us Hindu Indian philosophy, uh, they have been very appreciative of the Vedas, no one ever brought a uh, set of the Vedas into the classroom. And at the age of 20, I realized that here I am in Allahabad, growing up in India, I have never actually seen a complete set of Vedas. So I went to the Gita Press Gorakhpur, which is like the Bible Society of Hinduism, and I asked them if I can buy a complete set of the Vedas in Hindi. Now, my English is bad even today, but back then it was much worse, and I wanted to read the Vedas in Hindi. So the uh, manager of the bookshop said, sorry, we don't sell, uh, we don't translate and publish the Vedas. What? Why not? Because the Vedas cannot be translated. They are magical mantras that give you power. If you want to study the Vedas, you have to find a guru, sit at his feet for 14 years. He will teach you cor correct pronunciation, enunciation, intonation, and when to put how much ghee into the fire when you're uh, reciting a particular mantra. Uh, and then you will have power. But if you recite these mantras without the proper ritual, you might actually invoke evil, uh, demonic, pichashi powers, which is what the Shankaracharyas were saying uh, to the Prime Minister when he was about to do Pran Pradishthan in Ayodhya, that his improper uh, ritual, uh, performance of the ritual will, will bring demonic powers into the statue of Ram. This is what Shankaracharyas were saying, and they know what they were talking about because there are plenty of temples in, in India where uh, demonic powers manifest themselves. If you just Google that, uh, many of these videos are in Hindi, but I'm sure that uh, there are videos in other languages ex uh, as well which uh, tell you how much demonic power is there in uh, many of these temples. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, this, this was interesting that the manager of the Gita Press Gorak were telling me that um, the Vedas cannot be translated because, well, I, I said, because they are magical mantras to give you power. That helped me understand a lot of things. I had attended the Hindu weddings, etc., where uh, the pundit, the priest is reciting mantras. Nobody understands what he's saying uh, because those uh, mantras are not to be understood they are to for performing the ritual. And this is why the Brahmins didn't teach Sanskrit even to their own wives. As a result, Sanskrit never became the mother tongue of Brahmins. So Sanskrit was the language of the scholarly priest who had uh, memorize the Vedas and the other uh, Puranas and Upanishads at the feet of their gurus, but it was not the spoken language. There are only about 25,000 people in all of all the world 
uh, that speak Sanskrit today. So Sanskrit never became a mother tongue uh, because uh, the, the women were not even supposed to recite the, the Vedas, etc. You had to be a male, you had to be a trained priest. Be, be that as it may, it what the manager was saying, uh, he, he actually asked me that w when I said that it'll be nice to have some power, but right now I'm not looking for power, I'm looking for truth. What is truth? He said, but didn't you study uh, Mundaka Upanishad in your uh, university? I said, no, what's special about it? He said, Mundaka Upanishad, which is the largest Upanishad, one of the largest, it's uh, clear that no amount of the study of the Vedas will uh, lead anyone to the knowledge of truth because they were never written to give you the knowledge of truth. Well, that made sense because our uh, professors had, in fact, um, one of the Vedas that they had uh, discussed was the creation hymn in Rig Veda, which says that who knows how the universe was created. Uh, 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 gods themselves do not know, cannot know, because they came later in existence. So gods don't know. The Supreme God, God Brahma, Maybe he knows, maybe he doesn't know. Maybe even he doesn't know. So this is part of the creation hymn in the Rig Veda. So if uh, whether the gods or the Supreme God knows how and why the universe came into existence, we don't know if God knows. So obviously this cannot be God's word. Uh, this is priest's speculation, particularly the way there's the hymns that we did study as part of our course. Uh, the, the, there was skepticism that anybody, including the Supreme God, actu God actually knows the truth. So uh, I, I'll, for now, I'll skip uh, um, the discussion of uh, the, this conversation helped me to uh, decide that, okay, I should get a Quran and study the Quran. I'm in Allahabad. Uh, this is 1969. Allahabad was founded in 1575 by Akbar, uh, a Mughal emperor, a Muslim. <clears throat> so for 300 years, <clears throat> Allahabad was a Muslim city. Only recently, the BJP government made it Prayagraj, a Hindu city. Uh, but in between, it, it was dominated by the British rule. Um, because it was, for one day, Allahabad was the capital of India um, when the, the Mughal uh, ceded the power to the East India Company. And the negotiation after the Battle of Buxar happened in the Allahabad fort. So um, it was the missionary movement that made Allahabad the publishing capital for whole of North India, including Pakistan, uh, because uh, the missionaries were bringing a, a printing machine and a boat from Calcutta, uh, taking it up to the uh, up to Agra, where sh shipping was possible, um, and the boat uh, capsized in Allahabad. Uh, uh, in Yamuna, where, somewhere where the Agricultural Institute or Shuats is at this moment. So the printing press fell into the river and it took a long time to find it, uh, put it back and assemble it together, clean it up, get it operational. Uh, but then the missionaries decided why move to Agra, just uh, set up the printing press in Allahabad. And that's what made Allahabad the printing and publishing capital of North India. So most of the Urdu and Hindi and Punjabi and other stuff was printed in Allahabad. <clears throat> it was the first press in North India. And um, But uh, by the time we were around, m most of the uh, printing presses and publishing houses were owned and run uh, by Muslims in Allahabad. But as I went to the Muslim shops, uh, there were um, uh, no Quran available in Hindi. 
I asked what about Urdu, because we understood Urdu, even in our churches, Urdu was used, although in Roman script, uh, we understood Urdu. Uh, but th they said, no, the Quran cannot, Quran existed in heaven in Arabic, was um, uh, revealed in Arabic, is written in Arabic, it cannot be translated into other languages because translation corrupts the word of God. Um, uh, and that helped me. That helped me to understand why Muslim scholars, uh, even during the Mughal era uh, and after uh, and before that, so Islam had ruled Delhi for seven hundred years. It had ruled Allahabad for three hundred years. Um, but Islam, Islamic scholars had never developed Urdu. They had never developed Hindi. Uh, it was Martin. Um, Henry Martin in Kanpur, just north of Allahabad, on Yamuna River, he was the one who uh, collected the dialects to develop what we now call Urdu uh, through his translation of the New Testament. Um, and uh, Hindi came first with those Hindustani, out of which developed Urdu, and out of which, uh, in reaction to which developed Hindi. Urdu was leaning towards Persian, Arabic, vocabulary and the pundits didn't like that so they uh, asked the missionaries to uh, develop out of Hindustani what is now Hindi uh, a language which is collecting a number of dialects about 11 dialects fused together to create modern Hindi um, and uh, but draw the vocabulary from Sanskrit and other Indian languages uh, and that's how Hindi developed. And Hindi developed in Allahabad, the modern Hindi. Uh, Calcutta, Patna is where uh, Hindustani had developed. Uh, but modern Hindi developed in Allahabad, in what is Katra mission compound, where uh, Reverend uh, Samuel Kellogg lived. Kellogg died up in Missouri, and there is Kellogg Church there. Uh, but he wrote the, what is the standard Hindi grammar today. Um, um, uh, All India Radio and then Bollywood played important role in the development of modern Hindi. But th the fact that it was the missionary movement which was trying to take the word of God into the heart languages of the people that developed all of modern Indian languages because God wants to fill the earth with the knowledge of truth, with the spirit of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, uh, this was a biblical passion which began to transform. And this development of languages for which Islam had played no role, uh, they had built great forts and great uh, 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 Taj Mahal, etc. Well, uh, I, I guess my time is up. So let me very quickly, I have all of this written out which I we did not circulate because it is yet to be proofread and edited, which hopefully will be done today um, or by tomorrow. Uh, but it was at this time when my older sister, who died a few months ago, she told me to read the Bible. And I said that I have read the Bible. It is childish stories. She said, no, you were a child when you read the Bible. Uh, now you think you're a philosopher. So you read it uh, and see, read it critically and see if this is really uh, answering the questions that you have. And that's uh, why I began to read the Bible. Now, um, I said, OK. So I began reading the Bible um, and just Genesis 1 was so fascinating because it was answering questions that philosophy did not answer. Were there contradiction between what the university was saying and what Genesis 1 was saying? Absolutely. The big question is that uh, uh, the university was saying that the vegetable kingdom and animal kingdom arose millions of years after each other. Well, I was sitting on my balcony reading Genesis under 
the in the garden were all sorts of trees, in, including papaya trees, and I saw a butterfly uh, going between one tree and the other tree and back to the uh, first tree, and I knew that the male trees had only flowers; the female had flowers which uh, also produced fruit. So this, the what the butterfly was doing was cross pollination of pollen. This was intriguing. Uh, if the insects, the bees, the butterflies, the birds, they came millions of years after um, papaya, then how did papaya cross pollinate for those millions of years? They would be coming extinct. Or could, did the papaya diversify sexually, became male and female, bisexual, after they knew that bees and butterflies have come along. <clears throat> if they did, if the, the sexual diversification happened later, then how did the plants know that there are bees and birds so they can develop um, beautiful flowers and uh, smell and nectar, fragrance to attract these birds? Or could it be that one mind designed it all and that they came soon after each other, not millions of years after each other? Now, I didn't have enough information to resolve that issue, so I decided that, well, what, the, what Genesis 1 is saying, that this happened uh, by, this was designed by one mind and it happened soon after each other that I decided that I can put the question on the back. The Bible makes as much sense as what the university is saying. I'll, I'll decide this issue later, B but let me begin to look at it not as a scientist, but as a uh, student of philosophy, that is this making sense? Now, my time is up, therefore I really should stop uh, and give you time uh, for questions. But this, I found Genesis uh, and Exodus to be exciting. Leviticus was very boring. By the time I came to Judges and Ruth, I thought that the Bible was a morally repulsive book. Why should I be reading about this concubine who was raped the whole night, killed, and her husband, or uh, master, then cut up her body into 12 parts, sent it, uh, the body parts, to all the tribes, starting a civil war in which uh, the tribe of Benjamin was per particularly annihilated. Now, why am I reading all of this? Then came these books of First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Those six were uh, books were absolutely boring. Um, that why should I, I don't know enough about Indian history. Why am I reading this Jewish history that is describing how terrible the Jewish kings were, uh, that they did evil in the sight of the Lord and he killed them. I decided that this is boring. I'm not going to read it. Close the Bible once and for all. But something intrigued me. Indian history is always telling us how good, great, glorious, wonderful our ancient rulers was, where this Jewish history is telling me how rotten the Jewish kings were. So who wrote this? Did Kings couldn't have paid the historians to uh, describe all the evil deeds of their ancestors. Well, this must be the priests, the Brahmins who wrote, criticizing the rulers, the Kshatriyas. So I began to turn the pages again, and I was astonished to see that, in fact, this Jewish history book is telling me how rotten the Jewish religious system was. God hated the, the ceremonies, religious ceremonies and rituals. He saw their religious deeds as filthy rags. He killed his priests, destroyed his temple. Well, then this is a subaltern history from the point of view of little people who are exploited both by the rulers and the priests. So I began to turn the pages again to just prove my 
to my own satisfaction that, yes, this is Jewish history from the point of view of the little people. And I uh, was surprised, you know, you, you may not know that, but, but Hitler's Mein Kampf was the best-selling book on the streets in India in those days, because RSS was really promoting it. Um, but no, uh, Hitler didn't write anything as critical of uh, the Jewish common man, the average Jew, as the Jewish prophets. There's a lot of rubbish that is talked about the Hitler, uh, uh, Martin Luther's anti-Semitism. But there's nobody more anti-Semitic than the writers of the Old Testament, the Jews. They condemn uh, the Jews left, right, and center. I won't go into the details. So this is not the point of view of the common Jewish man uh, writing the Old Testament. So then this must be the work of prophets. These historical books must have been written by prophets who love to criticize everybody. I Here I am. I know these are very boring books, and I'm reading them for the fourth or fifth time within two months. Uh, just to confirm that this is the point of view of the prophets who are habitually critical of everybody. And I find that no, the books are saying that the majority of the prophets are false prophets, and the good ones are the losers. They were were trying to save their nation. They couldn't save themselves. They were beaten up, imprisoned, thrown in cisterns, killed. The nation was destroyed. But they are there in the Bible because their words turned out to be true within their lifetimes and after their lifetime. Uh, this The book books are actually saying that this is God's interpretation of Jewish history. Even if this is God's word, and I don't have the time to go into the details, even if this is God's word, why should I as an Indian be reading this book of Jewish history? That actually was the question that opened up my eyes that God called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob not to take their souls to heaven, he called Abraham, you follow me, you walk with me, I will bless you, I will make you a great nation, and through you I will bless all the nations, including India. India should be reading these books because these books are written for us. Israel could be a light for India, uh, is meant to be a light for India. And in fact, he did become light for my city. Allahabad became a city which gave seven of the first nine prime ministers from Nehru and Shastri and Indra Gandhi and V.P. Singh and Chandrasekhar. Chandrasekhar was the president of Allahabad University. Uh, nine of the uh, Murli Manohar Joshi could have been another one, but seven of the first nine prime ministers of India came from Allahabad because of what the Bible had done to the city of Allahabad. Now, this is a PhD level research that is needed, and I've not yet found somebody who is interested in this kind of a research. Uh, that, I mean, Rajiv Gandhi was also born in Allahabad. So, um, the, the, uh, the, the it's time to conclude that the Bible, the, the spiritual impact of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob transformed my city, created my university, my language, the municipality, uh, everything good in Allahabad came from the Bible during the colonial era, era uh, and afterwards. And it blessed the nation. But uh, my time is up, so this is just uh, to conclude in two sentences. Uh, this is ready for final edits and proofreading. We have the pictures of these people that I'm talking about, so we will have 70 to 100 page book. But the important need is to get a, a script writer who will turn this content into a presentable documentary script and to find a director, a studio, 
professional cameramen uh, and editors with music and pictures so that uh, this, my journey from philosophy to revelation, that God is there, he has spoken, and his word is the light in our darkness. Uh, this is our big need, and uh, we are looking for uh, immediately for donations to uh, get the script, uh, get the scriptwriter to rewrite the content uh, as a documentary script. Uh, but then we might look for investors who would help us produce a professional documentary, uh, which could be marketed professionally. So that's uh, what this particular um, um, piece is about. We also have the uh, discussion of idol worship, which I need to uh, start writing very soon. Um, I've done a small video, but we need to do a, a proper, a whole video series on idol worship because now Hindu students, even in Oxford University, are worshipping Saraswati. They are uh, forcing Christian institutions such as Shuats uh, to worship Saraswati. And I think it's time for us to speak clearly about why the Bible sees idol worship as a serious sin, one of the worst sins. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, this week, next week, we need to get this book done on uh, moving backward casts forward. This is the issue that, um, from the point of view of um, Rahul Gandhi, is the most important issue. And uh, he doesn't really have the answer. Uh, he's uh, hoping the reservations will solve the problem. Uh, but but he's right uh, in pointing out that the whole society that India has created is an unjust society where the backward castes do not have justice. So uh, that, that book is also almost ready. I want to add one or two chapters. So your help is... Uh, will, is appreciated for these efforts, but I close here. Uh, if there is time, I'll be glad to take questions, but we we can do questions another time. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. Uh, marathon you know uh, <laughs> marathon uh, run or you know short sprint over world philosophy and your personal you know journey and uh, you know praise god for elder sisters i guess that might be the <laughs> that might be what we can conclude from short conclusion uh, let me call uh, and i mean is there any questions there were a number of comments uh, there are any live questions we can ask uh, right now? I could just answer one question, which uh, is there about why, uh, why would Nietzsche learn Sanskrit? How would it help him to understand the Buddha? The d distinction between Hinduism and Buddhism didn't exist in uh, at that time. Uh, the, the word Hinduism was used only uh, after Nietzsche by Ram Mohan Roy and others. So Hinduism is a Western in construct by Indologists. So when they were studying Buddha, uh, they, it didn't matter to them. Of course, Buddha didn't write anything uh, in any language, but certainly not in Sanskrit. Uh, but uh, the, the, that kind of information was not there. They were learning Sanskrit to study Vedas, Upanishads, Puranas, etc., Okay, there's a question from the from YouTube, comment on YouTube. Can you give me a, a reading list to build a solid Christian worldview? 
perhaps we can compile this at a different time but uh, i mean yes uh, another question on jonathan by jonathan from michigan usa how do you differentiate the benefits of the spread of christianity while the western view right now is that all colonialism is bad well the western view is foolish um this is part of deconstructionism uh the, the, the it's it's a, it's a myth um when the reason british east india company began to uh had to fight with the muslim nawab of calcutta murshidabad and not calcutta but north of calcutta murshidabad was because the nawab had invaded the fort william uh, the the colony of the english to loot uh, he believed because the lifestyle of the british colony was so much higher than the indian villages they assumed that the british had hidden a lot of money in fort william and he uh, invaded uh, fort william to uh, find that treasure which the british had hidden and he didn't find any uh, treasure so he uh, imprisoned uh, something like 145 men women most of them died at night this was april very hot in a, a hall which didn't have standing room for those people um and only one english woman survived he took her in his harem so the british realized that they cannot trade in india they were trading with permission of shah jahan the mughal emperor had given them the legal permission to trade and, and they um, they were trading so the, the there in madras now chennai there was a clerk robert clive who had no military training no military experience he realized that all the indian kings will start invading us um, our uh, factories unless we deal with this so he marched with uh, uh, about a thousand people including mostly south indian mercenaries and beat the nawab in murshidabad uh, who had more than 60000 troops including french artillery and french uh, mercenaries with him so he uh, clive had no technological superiority but through their devilry and deception uh, and bribe he beat and then there were two three other wars so uh, there was no colonialism they were not trying to take over india when they they became the most important power so it was in allahabad fort that the mughal emperor who lost the battle of baksar gave the diwani administration of bengal which included assam uh, bihar odisha bangladesh uh, the administrative authority to collect taxes for the mughal empire was given to the east india company later the east india company began to fight the um, marathas there were three great wars with marathas and uh, um, then came the mutiny of 1857 um, so the colonial the the uh, the word colonialism that is a dirty word today uh is a dirty word because we don't really know the history of what happened britain britain liberated india from the muslim rules muslims had ruled delhi for 700 years until 1857 starting with 1192 when mohammad ghori defeated prithviraj chauhan in 1191 92 so the the So the british liberated india from muslim rule united 562 kingdoms into one nation taught us how to govern ourselves and handed over india to liberal hindus uh, gandhi nehru patel um this was uh the 
was, was money looted, etc. Well, modern India was created by uh, colonial England. Uh, there were lots of people who looted, but lots of people came to bless. It's just like the Hindutva Brigade today is persecuting frontline missionaries, Christian hospitals, Christian institutions, such as Shuats. These Brahmins and Thakurs and uh, Hindu and Muslim elite would have never allowed the lower castes to be educated, healed, and developed if uh, the colonial power, if the British were not ruling. So one of the biggest things that the uh, evangelical movement did was to exercise control through the parliament to make sure that the British, uh, the, if the colonial rulers are exploiting, they will allow the missionaries to come and serve and bless India. So basically the whole mindset which sees colonialism as nothing but a dirty word is a foolish deconstructionist idea. Um, modern India exists uh, in, in the, the, during the colonial period, the evangelical movement gave to India for the first time in its history a clean government, clean politicians is, without corruption, people like Nehru and Shastri. And it, it's only after Indira Gandhi that the corruption really came into India. Um, uh, so so the, the whole development, the whole issue of justice which Rahul Gandhi is championing right now. This is a legacy of uh, Christian presence in India. The, the, there would be no Hindu who would be uh, campaigning on behalf of the lower castes, backward caste, against the hegemony of the upper caste if the, the, the colonial rule had not been there, which facilitate, facilitated the idea of human equality. So... Uh, so basically, uh, the anti-colonial rhetoric is foolish, simplistic. It does not understand Indian history. It does not do justice to Indian history. People like Shadi Shashi Tharoor use it simply because he wants to become the prime, wanted to become the prime minister of India, uh, and he thought that if he uh, attacks colonialism rather than attacking fas Hindu fascism. Uh, he might get the support of um, the BJP when the time comes where BJP might agree on having him as the, the prime minister rather than having Rahul Gandhi as the prime minister. So, so we have to understand what's really happening. And we, I have several books. Most of them need reprinting, uh, but on the history of colonialism, and the relationship of colonialism and mission, one can agree that, yes, colonialism was evil, necessary evil, but it was evil. The good thing was that during that colonial period, uh, missions were able to come and uh, reform the British government and reform India, uh, uh, began to reform India. And th 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 this is... Like right now, if India, if the grassroots level India has to be educated and become economically prosperous, uh, we have to, one, get rid of the American idea of missions, uh, which only takes souls to heaven or people groups to heaven. And on the other hand, we have to get rid of the fascist idea of Hinduism, uh, which would not allow conversion, would not allow teaching the Bible. The only force that can cultivate the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom. So Hindu fascism is as evil as colonialism ever was. I stop there. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Zachary. It does seems like most of the major world religions are based on hearsay rather than the actual texts of these religions. Any thoughts? It's a big question. 
and it's not really directly related to my talk. So why don't we postpone yes, that? Yes, we'll skip for another time. Yes, Brother Sonny Matthew has a raised hand here. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Vishal. Oh, sorry, you're muted. You no. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for what you shared. You know, one one question I had was uh, uh, the the age of reason, the enlightened period, suppressed uh, or they promoted secessionism, right? And and uh, the devoid of that realm of power manifestation like john wesley the moravians they did not believe in secessionism right they were they believed in the supernatural yeah. and was that one of the reasons why you all those hippies went to india <laughs> you know you know seeking for a different kind of power because the actual uh, legitimate power was available but that was not uh, promoted. And you, you see also Thomas Jefferson. He cut out uh, all the miracles from the Bible, right? So, you know, that whole promotion of uh, a holistic understanding of Christianity and even secessionism, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it came from the Reformation period, right? So what is... You know, and and you yeah. you explained beautifully about the elephant. You know, uh, someone who knows the entire uh, elephant. Uh, so in that sense, if somebody doesn't understand truth holistically, you know, the the aspect of experience also uh, together when with understanding thoughts you know like experiencing god with mind and body and spirit the holistic understanding and an encounter with god not just in rational thinking alone yeah well uh, th th thank you that's a, a very important helpful question uh christianity did create the uh, disenchanted world of modernity. So the world was enchanted with spirits. So Martin Luther, when he's uh, before he dedicated himself to become a monk, he's walking and there is a lightning that strikes and he's praying to the patron saint of the miners because his father was a miner. Um, so so th they're seeing uh, gods and not gods, supernatural powers, demons, uh, etc. Everywhere. So if you r read his hymn, "A Mighty Fortress Is Our God," uh, you see that uh, though this world we de with devils filled should threaten to undo do us, etc. So uh, the medieval world was enchanted world. The modern world of science. Well, okay, there may be demons living in the trees and the bushes and the animals in the river, but human beings are supposed to establish their dominion on this earth. We can disregard the presence of these demons, uh, cast them out, that we are going to rule over this river, not worship this river or fear this river. So that idea uh, of human beings are supposed to be governing this planet, not the spirit realm, uh, did grow out of the Reformation, but that was not secessionism. Secessionism as a theological idea that the supernatural miracles and healings, etc., don't exist. Um, this was a particular idea that uh, developed in Amongst the Reformed theologians, B.B. Warfield was one of them uh, in America in the early 20th century, which was a climax of that whole process of uh, disenchanting the world, uh, uh, with the, uh, replacing it with the world of science, replacing the world of superstitions with the world of science, 
uh, which did manifest itself in the theological stream of uh, uh, secessionism, which people like uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, when they began to see the, the, secular, the two world wars, and how could the most educated nation in Europe, strongest nation, Germany, become as evil as it did? Is there an evil supernatural? Is Satan real? Uh, does he act? So in Screwtape Letters, but Narnia, The Lord of the Rings, the supernatural dimension of evil, uh, th these uh, they begin to reconsider. So, so you do have Gandalf resisting the supernatural evil in Lo Lord of the Rings. Um, and th so while the American um, theologians, particularly, it, it, I mean, Warfield is defending the Bible, but is also teaching secessionism. Uh, but the Europeans with Lewis and Tolkien, uh, his uh, abolition of man, abolition of spirit, which is basically, and translated into fiction, that hideous strength, in these, Lewis explores the evil supernatural, the world of demons, which incidentally, Shankaracharyas were really warning Modi that if what you're doing in Ayodhya will bring demonic powers into play. And much of it, this was in Hindi social media, so many people may have missed it, but our Hindu gurus are very aware of the presence of the demonic powers in many of the idols and many of these temples. Uh, and we, of course, in Allahabad, Benicia Darbar, we, I have literally seen hundreds, maybe a thousand uh, people uh, being delivered from demons and physical healing uh, following. So yes, the American theology, which dominates section of the evangelical movement in the name of secessionism today is wrong. Of course, you are in a place where uh, Pat Robertson and Gordon Robertson uh, have rejected secessionism and affirmed publicly uh, their reality of healing, uh, uh, physical healing and casting out demons. So, um, so yes, uh, we've had this naturalistic, materialistic perspective dominating a section of the evangelical theology in America. Uh, but this is, uh, this is naive because Satan is real. Um, what is satanic? What is demonic? Are all the demons fallen angels who fell with Satan? Uh, this is what um, uh, many of the mainstream evangelical theologians would believe, but uh, people like Carl Jung uh, believe that no fresh demons are created. We often create our own demons. If you nurture a spirit of hatred, jealousy, or lust in your heart, uh, it becomes a spiritual power which begins to control you, and you cannot control yourself anymore. Uh, you are enslaved by these, uh, what Jung would call our own demons. So in Carl Jung, this language of uh, demons uh, is very prominent, but he sees that many of these demons are created by us. So all, all the spirits are not pre-existing spirit. When a child is born, the child is born because of rape or incest. Did God create a spirit and put into that child? Or is spirit something that uh, uh, develops? The new spirits are born when a new child is born. So could those evil spirit, demonic spirit, using a Jungian language, uh, or do we have to impose an evangelical mindset that no, all the demons are fallen angels, uh, they are spirit entities, what is a spirit entity, etc. We don't really have enough information, 
but I think a fresh discussion of this, you, you've had in America, particularly from coming out of Fuller Seminary with Wimber and uh, Proft, uh, that Christians uh, can become victims possessed by the demons that they have created in their own hearts, um, and they need deliverance. I, I think that's a perspective that uh, deserves to be investigated over against the secessionist perspective uh, that continues to dominate a lot of the evangelical seminaries and thinking um, that, yes, there are demons, but these are demons which fell from heaven uh, along with Satan. Uh, um, but I, I, do, I don't, I personally, I don't think that's a satisfactory uh, perspective. Um, b b the, the, the world should not be run by spirits. Human beings should establish their dominion. That's the scientific spirit. Yes. And that's the impact of Christianity in uh, creating the modern world of science, which is not an enchanted world. But does that mean that the supernatural Holy Spirit, angels, demons don't exist, and they don't have an independent spiritual existence, they do. And that's the theological worldview conflict.